Stonehenge is one of the great cultural icons of the world, but it's also the scene of one of the world's biggest scientific conspiracies. Let me explain what I mean. The monument itself is, according to all the tales told by archaeologists, made from stones carried by Neolithic tribesmen from two different locations. One was in West Wales and the other was on the northern edge of Salisbury Plain. Both of these transport enterprises must, if the archaeologists are right, have involved a huge amount of human effort. The stone settings are in the middle of a larger monument comprising an embankment and a ditch and various other features like post holes. This is a reconstruction of what Stonehenge is supposed to have looked like in its finished form. With a large setting of trilithons in the centre, these pillars with lintels on top, an outer stone circle with lintels and various settings of smaller stones in the middle. But we don't know whether this idealised arrangement of pillars, lintels and freestanding bluestones was ever completed since all of the early artistic impressions that we have show the monument in a pretty ruinous state, rather similar to what we see today, with very many stones totally missing and with the rest of the monument in a tumble-down state as well. There are two sorts of stones at Stonehenge. The big ones are the sarsen stones, which are made of a local type of silicified sandstone, found particularly in various places on the edges of Salisbury Plain. And then the smaller stones, which are overshadowed by the sarsens, are the blue stones. They come in various shapes and sizes. Some of them are flattish slabs, some are pillars, and some are irregular shaped boulders. There are several conspiracies at work here. The first involves the sarsens, which are said to have been carried from Overton Down on the northern edge of Salisbury Plain. We can see on this map the circles which show the locations of sarsens today. But it's never actually been proved that the stones were carried from a long way away, and it's much more likely that they were collected up from the immediate neighbourhood of Stonehenge. The sarsens themselves are a pretty irregular collection of stones. A lot of them are misshapen, with rough projections, holes and cracks. This is the heel stone, which was not particularly carefully selected, and this leaning stone is stone number 11, tilted at a crazy angle and far too small ever to have supported a lintel. All of the early paintings that we have show large numbers of stones missing from Stonehenge. Were they ever there in the first place? I doubt it. There's another conspiracy relating to the blue stones. These are said to have been carried all the way from West Wales, from a quarry in a place called Carnminey in the Preseli Hills of Pembrokeshire. The story is that the stones were collected from there because they were deemed to be sacred in some way, worth carrying all the way to Stonehenge. There were supposedly more than 80 of them on the site. This map shows the various routes that have been suggested over the years for the tribal groups who supposedly undertook this great expedition over land and sea before delivering the stones safely to the site of the early Stonehenge monument but they haven't all come from the Carnminey neighbourhood. Geologists have now shown that they have come from at least 20 different locations. The main location in Priscelli is a place called Carn Goidog, which is shown in this picture, and it's also known now from recent ge geological research that some of the stones have come from the North Pembrokeshire coast, for example, quite close to Newport, and some from locations as yet unidentified. There has been another discovery in the last few years that the altar stone, which is supposed to have come from Milford Haven, has actually come from the Brecon Beacons or from Carmarthenshire, well away from any of the preferred bluestone transport routes. A decade ago, in the year 2000, an attempt was made to carry one bluestone all the way from the Preseli Hills to Stonehenge. These pictures show the enterprise underway, involving haulage crews and these two beautiful curras which were supposed to carry the bluestone from Milford Haven across the Bristol Channel. Sadly, it ended up on the bottom of the haven because the seamen involved couldn't make the craft stable enough to do the job in choppy seas. The stone had to be rescued by the Royal Navy and it never did get out into the open sea, let alone to Stonehenge. 
There's another conspiracy relating to the suppression of evidence showing what happened during the Ice Age. There is no doubt that most of the blue stones currently at Stonehenge have come from West Wales, but it now appears much more likely that the stones were carried by glacial ice rather than by Neolithic tribesmen. This map shows the route followed by the Great Irish Sea Glacier on at least one occasion, maybe 450,000 years ago, as it came in from the Irish Sea across Pembrokeshire and up the Bristol Channel towards the Somerset Levels and the edge of Salisbury Plain. This is a computer model showing us that the ice probably did cover Salisbury Plain on at least one occasion during the Ice Age. And this photo gives an impression of what Somerset might have looked like at the time, with the ice coming in from the west, flowing in a series of ice tongues across the lowlands and around the flanks of the Mendips and the other hill masses. So let's return to the old ruin that we call Stonehenge. It's my belief that the human transport theory relating to both the Sarsons and the Bluestones has no evidence whatsoever in support of it. My belief is that the stones were all collected up in the vicinity of Stonehenge, and that's true of both the Sarsons and the Bluestones. I think that the Bluestones were deposited somewhere to the west of Stonehenge by glacial ice, and that they were collected from there. I'm also quite convinced that Stonehenge was never finished. My guess is that the builders simply ran out of stones, both Sarsons and Bluestones, or that they ran out of energy. They changed the stone settings many times, and after many displays of indecision, they gave up and walked away, leaving a jerry-built shambles behind them. Another example of a grand design never brought to fruition. This book describes for you both the pros and the cons of the human transport and glacial transport theories. This website will give you more information, and I also make regular posts on this blog. Comments are welcome. I would like to thank Callum John for his editing work and also Sibelian for the music that's been used in this video. And thank you very much for watching.